From the headquarters of Tell Us Your English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sweeney Green. We start in Venezuela where the government is pushing for the adoption of the Petro, the cryptocurrency launched on Tuesday. President Nicolas Maduro has said the digital currency can be used for tourist services. I have authorized the use of the Petro cryptocurrency for national and international tourist services and facilities across the country under special circumstances. The Petro, which is scheduled to begin trading in April, is seen as the answer to Venezuela's economic crisis. It is hoped the currency can bypass U.S.-imposed sanctions and attract billions of dollars in foreign investments. The Petro cryptocurrency is the first and sole digital currency issued by a government in the world. The Venezuelan government has started to pre-sell it on February 20 as a schedule, through which the government could raise a large amount of fund. This is very important. The Brazilian Senate has approved a decree that authorizes army generals to take over Rio de Janeiro's security. The decree was approved by 55 votes to 13, but the details of the plan still need to be finalized. The move is aimed at curbing violence dri driven by drug gangs. This is the first time the armed forces have been put in charge of law enforcement since the end of a two-decade military dictatorship in 1985. And it has generated widespread debate among lawmakers and critics. But the government says that invoking the help of the army is a necessity. In Rio de Janeiro's urban reality, you often go out with an arrest warrant to a house in the community, and the bad guy moves. So we need to have mass arrest warrants, which has been done on other occasions. We need to go back to work that is more efficient, developed for both the military and the police. It is the moment supporters of Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva have been waiting for. The former Brazilian president, who has been sentenced to 12 years in jail, is expected to announce his presidential candidacy in Belo Horizonte today. Our correspondent, Ignacio Limas, has more. We are here in the Maria da Concesao occupation, where former President Luis Ignacio da Silva has arrived to meet more than 700 families of the Landless Workers Movement, MST. This occupation stems from 150 women who occupy this property that belongs to the millionaire Eike Batista. More than 4,000 people arrived prior to his speech, where he will announce his presidential candidacy tonight in the capital of Belo Horizonte. Lula has also referred to the recent military intervention decreed by Michel Temer, which he qualified as a demagogic measure to gain certain parts of the population who have asked for more public security. But this is not a step that solves the security crisis in Rio de Janeiro. Lula da Silva insisted there is a need for social policies in Brazil, which have worsened since the arrival of Michel Temer to power. Lula will confirm his pre-candidature tonight in the city of Belo Horizonte. Back to you. Lula also declared his support for the MST movement. He said he will never betray the interests of the working class and will fight against the reforms proposed by the government. He claims those measures will negatively affect the poor. Lula also condemned the administration's latest decision to hand over Rio de Janeiro security to the army. Ahead of the candidacy announcement, Lula's defense filed a new appeal against his 12-year prison sentence. They say the ruling had 38 omissions, 15, 16 contradictions, and five areas lacking clarity. The three judges that sentenced Lula will be in charge of reviewing this appeal. In Peru, a bus has collided with a truck and fallen off a cliff, killing at least 35 people. Telesio's Jaime Herrera tweeted that the accident happened in the southern Arequipa region. The bus plunged 200 meters towards a riverbank. This is the second major accident of its kind in Peru of this year. In January, 50 people died when a bus went off the coastal road north of Lima. Still in Peru, former dictator Alberto Fujimori may be back in court soon. A Peruvian judge has decided that Fujimori can be trialed 
for, tried for killings in the 1990s, despite a pardon by the cu country's current president. With the humanitarian pardon granted by President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, as well as the application of a statute of limitation, Fujimori had been excluded from all judicial pending process. However, the judiciary decided to nullify that and to try Fujimori for the torture and execution of six peasants north of Lima, known as the Petivilica Massacre in the year 1992. My son-in-law was tortured, burned, shot. I woke up desperate. My God, I said, what's happening? What happened? They were already unconscious, and they could not speak at all until we went to see them. We have had them covered in a house, all six. We have buried the six. In the Petivilica massacre case, the prosecution is pre-requesting a 25-year jail sentence for Fujimori and the payment of a civil reparation of $150,000. They are trying him as being directly responsible for a crime against humanity. The presidency of the republic approved a policy that had to do with the creation of death squads, in this case which were given resources. All the facilities, all the logistical devices, the personnel, it was all approved as well as administration in order to carry out these crimes. These murders of select targets, they were also given guarantees of impunity. For progressive politicians, this will not just be a blow for Fujimorismo, but also for President Kicinski. They assured that the recent judicial resolution demonstrates that the statute of limitations granted to the dictator in last December was not for humanitarian reasons. They demonstrated that this was part of a negotiation. Second, it's been demonstrated that it was unconstitutional because the man was a violator of human rights. The political agreement has been confirmed. The indignation of this process is that Pedro Pablo Kuczynski negotiated his stay with the release of a convict. For now, human rights organizations and families of the victims of former dictator Fujimori continue to wait as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights determines whether or not to grant Fujimori the statute of limitations or whether he should return to jail. Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Ariasa is in the Angolan capital, Luanda, as part of a tour to strengthen international relations. Ariasa was received by his counterpart, Manuel Domingo Augusto. The two sides are already cooperation, cooperating in sustainable energy and the development of human resources. However, Ariasa says there is potential for further collaboration, especially in light of the international pressure being put on Venezuela. There are many areas of cooperation that we are developing with Angola. The oil sector, the mining and the diamond ones, we have many projects to develop together. And then there's the political situation in Venezuela, the attacks to the Bolivarian Revolution, the agreements that we signed in the Dominican Republic that the opposition didn't want to sign, the upcoming election in which President Maduro will be candidate. After that, President Maduro also wants to come to Angola and defend our relationship. The final version of the trade deal between Asia Pacific's fastest growing economies, Canada and Mexico, has been agreed. Eleven nations are involved in the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. The deal will be signed in Chile on March 8th. It will cut taxes on trade by $10 trillion. The obvious missing party is the U.S. after President Donald Trump pulled out of the pact last January. The success of this deal has been touted as the antidote to growing U.S. protectionism. The original TPP proposal was opposed by trade unions and campaigners as a threat to jobs and the environment. Priority now is to make sure that TPP 11 becomes effective. Uh, we spent so much time in negotiating. <laughs> And now is the time that we are, you know, the, the entry into force is within our sight. Ecuador and the United States are looking to strengthen trade ties to bolster their economies. However, their commercial agreement is causing distress for campesinos and indigenous organizations. 
The biggest fear in the campesino organizations is that the trade agreement with the U.S. will give American agriculture products greater access to the Ecuadorian market. This will mean total destruction of our products. Our agriculture sovereignty will disappear and all the products with transgenics will come from the U.S. In 2017, Ecuador approved a law which allows the use of genetically modified seeds for research purposes. But the Food Sovereignty Board is concerned that these transgenic seeds will make its way out of laboratories and into the fields. A law was approved in which transgenics might enter the country to be used strictly for research purposes and to be handled by universities. We oppose to everything outside the law. Transgenics cannot come here if it is not solely for research. What is of concern now is whether the trade agreement with the U.S. addresses the issue of transgenic crops. We will fight against this free trade agreement. Let's not forget what happens in Mexico, Colombia and Peru. Despite these concerns, supporters of the agreement argue the agreement will benefit the economy. Signing FTAs is very important because we must lower taxes in order to bring new possibilities to the country to export. That means it would also increase the number of jobs. And if you get investment in Ecuador, they must hire Ecuadorians. While FTAs are considered an economic boon, the influx of foreign products have often squeezed out smaller players in the market. And that has the campesino and indigenous organizations on edge about what this agreement could mean for their livelihood. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. day and age when someone can get away with killing somebody. When someone can get away with saying, I accidentally walked to the storage room, the storage shed. I accidentally grabbed the gun out of the storage box. And then I accidentally walked back to the car. And then I accidentally raised my arm in level with the late, late Colton Bushy's head. Then my finger accidentally pressed the trigger. What a bunch of garbage. We continue praying that something is done and that we could go home and tell the people that we tried hard and we're still going to keep trying and we're going to keep going and this ain't going to stop until something changes for the better. Welcome back. In Mexico, the relatives of the 43 missing students of Ayusinapa say the case is being used as a political gimmick in the presidential elections. They are condemning president's use of the case during political rallies. The families argue the politicians have never supported their search for truth, truth and justice. It's been three years since the students disappeared in what their families described as forced disappearance at the hands of the police. And Mexican authorities are investigating whether the police are involved in the disappearance of three Italian citizens. The men went missing on January 31st after being detained by the police at a gas station in the western state of Jalisco. They haven't been heard from since. Families and friends of the three men demonstrated in Naples over the weekend, demanding action from the Mexican government. 
Mexico is facing a surge in violent crime, with more than 25,000 killings last year. Authorities say they're looking into the matter, but defended the delay in the investigation. When they initially reported the disappearance, we were told they were tourists, that they were on vacation, and that delayed our investigation. Why? Because we didn't have that lead into the investigation, that they were not tourists, but they were actually selling some sort of goods instead. The special envoy sent to Chile by Pope Francis to investigate allegations of a sex abuse cover-up has been taken to hospital. Archbishop Charles Chiclunia is undergoing gallbladder surgery. According to the Catholic Bishops' Conference spokesman, the Vatican investigator is in Chile to hear the testimonies of sexual abuse victims. He has already met with several witnesses as part of a probe into Bishop Juan Barrios. And sexual crimes against children in Ecuador will no longer be sub subject to a statute of limitations. The decision to have no time limits on sexual crimes against children was supported by 70% of Ecuadorian voters in the February 4th referendum. President Lenin Moreno said Ecuadorian constitution and the penal code will be modified to ensure the full application of the law. In Argentina, workers and social movements are taking to the streets of Buenos Aires to protest the government's economic measures and workers' layoffs. Our correspondent, Egado Esteban, reports. This demonstration is organized by the General Labor Confederation with the support of trade unions, social movements, and human rights organizations. It's a continuation of protests against the measures pushed by the Mauricio Macri government. Workers are asking the administration to stop layoffs. In 2018, there have been more than 2,500 layoffs in the public sector, persecution of union leaders, and the pressure Mauricio Macri is placing on trade unions. There is a lot of expectation one of the union leaders will speak during the demonstration. The tensions between the two sides has really intensified lately. We thank Ricardo Esteban for that report. And still in Argentina, organizations are fighting for legal, safe, and free abortion. They started a campaign on Twitter and are organizing a handkerchief protest in front of the Congress. It's part of the activities planned before International Women's Day on the 8th of March. Hundreds of adult and young women gathered to ask the Argentine parliament to open a discussion about the voluntary interruption of pregnancy project. Legalization is what really gives women access to their most basic health rights, which are denied by the state, and this is a form of violence. Women should be able to decide about their bodies, what they want and what they can do in certain circumstances. Protesters call for a division between church and state because they believe that religion is the only obstacle in approving this law, which has been presented seven times since 2007. How can the health minister look away when this is the main cause of maternal death here? How can he ignore us when there has been more than 60,000 abortions, regardless of what the law says? He must look for a solution. If not, a lot of young and poor women will keep dying or getting injured because of unsafe underground abortions. There are 60,000 patients each year. This is not right. This is a public health problem. Feminist leaders assured that this is also a social justice issue because it affects mainly the most vulnerable women. There's a lot of hypocrisy in this. There are women who have the resources, and for them, an abortion is not a problem, nor something they can't get. But without legalization, it is looked at as something shameful. There are complaints regarding legal abortions in Argentina. There are problems with access to contraceptive methods, and sexual education has been censored. <laughs> On the 8th of March, they will mobilize once again for the right to safe, legal, and free abortions, and will also ask for public policy to prevent and fight violence against women. 
They will be present in all the plazas of Argentina. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Palestinian President Mah Mahmoud Abbas said that Israel continues to violate international law. He made those comments during an address at the United Nations on Tuesday. Our correspondent Noah Harazin has more from Gaza. After the speech of the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas yesterday, Palestinians here on the ground in Gaza and the West Bank are fully supporting the Palestinian President and the Palestinian leadership, uh, refusing the uh, U.S. Uh, political blackmail to push Palestinians back to the negotiating table um, uh, with Israel. Palestinians do uh, believe what their leadership believe that uh, Palestinians will not go back to the negotiating un uh, negotiating un until uh, Israel stop violating all the UN resolutions and all the Palestinian-Israeli agreements, stop occupying more Palestinian land and stop uh, building more settlements and the illegal settlements in the West Bank and also stop arresting uh, Palestinians uh, and putting them under administrative detention. So uh, for now, Palestinians are hopeful. They do also have hope in the international community and other countries that they will uh, stand up by the Palestinian people and by the Palestinian cause. Thanks for that, Noor. Now let's take a quick look at some other news from around the world. Explosion on a bus in Sri Lanka has injured at least 19 people, most of them are military personnel. According to the initial investigation, a grenade exploded in a passenger's bag. The bus was travelling between Jaffna to the town of Dhiya Thalava, where one of country's main military training centres is located. Jaffna was part of the northern heartland of ethnic minority Tamils, who battled the government for a separate state for 26 years until their defeat in 2009. I opened the gate and came out and saw that a bus had stopped. People inside were shouting. We didn't know whether it was a bomb or not. We helped the people out of the bus and sent them to hospitals in the vehicles. U.S. influential evangelist Billy Graham has passed away at the age of 99. He died in his home in Montreal, North Carolina. He was a counselor to many U.S. presidents and widely traveled across the world to spread Christianity. According to his office, he preached to more people than anyone else in history, reaching hundreds of millions either in person or via TV and satellite links. A day after young students in Washington, D.C. protested at the White House against the shootings in the U.S. and the death of 17 students in Florida school, President Donald Trump said that he has signed a memorandum directing the Attorney General to propose legislation that would ban all devices that turn legal weapons into machine guns. While speaking from the White House, Trump said he's ready to take action. We must actually make a difference. We must move past cliches and tired debates and focus on evidence-based solutions and security measures that actually work and that make it easier for men and women of law enforcement to protect our children and to protect our safety. 
The office of the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has said that the North Korean officials cancelled a secret meeting scheduled between Pence and the North Korean leader's sister Kim Yo-jong and the nominal head of the state Kim Yong-nam. The meeting was supposed to take place in South Korea during the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang on February 10th, but was called off by North Korean side just two hours before the meeting. Fighting between armed rebels and Syrian forces has intensified in Ghouta in eastern Syria. Pro-government forces are trying to retake the last major rebel stronghold. Reports say more than 200 people have been killed in the last two days. In another development, pro-Syrian government fighters enter the region of Afrin on Tuesday to support the Kurdish militia, which has been under attack by Turkey. They were reportedly fired upon by Turkish forces, risking further military escalation between the two countries. And finally, Afro-Colombian communities celebrated Black Christmas in the village of Quinamayao in West Colombia over the weekend. As part of the annual celebration, a black doll representing the baby Jesus is carried through the town in a colorful procession. The tradition dates back to the days of slavery, when slaves were not allowed to celebrate Christmas because they were busy working during the festive season. So they moved the event to February when they could celebrate it. We've come to the end of this morning's news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.